12, June 1975. Todd Bowden, now 14, came biking up Dusander's walk and parked his bike on the kickstand. The L.A. Times was on the bottom step. He picked it up. He looked at the bell below which the neat legends Arthur Denker and no solicitors, no peddlers, no salesmen still kept their places. He didn't bother with the bell now, of course. He had his key. Somewhere close by was the popping, burping sound of a lawn boy. He looked at Dusander's grass and saw it could use a cutting. He would have to tell the old man to find a boy with a mower. Dusander forgot little things like that more often now. Maybe it was senility. Maybe it was just the pickling influence of ancient age on his brains. That was an adult thought for a boy of fourteen to have, but such thoughts no longer struck Todd as singular. He had many adult thoughts these days. Most of them were not so great. He let himself in. He had his usual instant of cold terror as he entered the kitchen and saw Dusander slumped slightly sideways in his rocker, the cup on the table, the half-empty bottle of bourbon beside it. A cigarette had burned its entire length down to a lacy gray ash in a mayonnaise cover where several other butts had been mashed out. Dusander's mouth hung open. His face was yellow. His big hands dangled limply over the rocker's arms. He didn't seem to be breathing. Dusander, he said a little too harshly. Rise and shine, Dusander. He felt a wave of relief as the old man twitched, blinked, and finally sat up. This is you. And so early. They let us out early on the last day of school, Todd said. He pointed to the remains of the cigarette in the mayonnaise cover. Someday you'll burn down the house doing that. Maybe, Dusander said indifferently. He fumbled out his cigarettes, shot one from the pack it almost rolled off the edge of the table before Dusander was able to catch it, and at last got it going. A protracted fit of coughing followed, and Todd winced in disgust. When the old man really got going, Todd half expected him to start spitting out grayish-black chunks of lung tissue onto the table, and he'd probably grin as he did it. At last the coughing eased enough for Dusander to say, What have you got there? Report card. Dusander took it, opened it, and held it away from him at arm's length so he could read it. English, A. American history, A. Earth science, B+. Plus. Your community and you, A. Primary French, B-. minus. Beginning algebra, B. He put it down. Very good. What is the slang? We have saved your bacon, boy. Will you have to change any of these averages in the last column? French and algebra. But no more than eight or nine points in all. I don't think any of this is ever going to come out. And I guess I owe that to you. I'm not proud of it, but it's the truth. So thanks. What a touching speech, Duzander said. I began to cough again. I guess I won't be seeing you around too much from now on, Todd said. And Dusander abruptly stopped coughing. No, he said politely enough. No, Todd said. We're going to Hawaii for a month, starting on June 25th. In September, I'll be going to school across town. It's this busing thing. Oh, yes, the Schwarzen, Dusander said, idly watching a fly as it trundled across the red and white check of the oilcloth. For twenty years this country has worried and whined about the Schwarzen, but we know the solution, don't we, boy? He smiled toothlessly at Todd, and Todd looked down, feeling the old sickening lift and drop in his stomach. Terror, hate, and a desire to do something so awful it could only be fully contemplated in his dreams. Look, I plan to go to college, in case you didn't know, Todd said. I know that's a long time off, but I think about it. I even know what I want to major in, history. Admirable. He who will not learn from the past is... Oh, shut up, Todd said. Dusander did so amiably enough. He knew the boy wasn't done. Not yet. He sat with his hands folded, watching him. I could get my letter back from my friend, Todd suddenly blurted. You know that? I could let you read it, and then you could watch me burn it. If, if I would remove a certain document from my safety deposit box. Well, yeah. Dusander uttered a long, windy, rueful sigh. My boy, 
he said. Still, you do not understand the situation. You never have, right from the beginning. Partly because you are only a boy, but not entirely. Even in the beginning, you were a very old boy. No, the real villain was and is your absurd American self-confidence that never allowed you to consider the possible consequences of what you were doing, which does not allow it even now. Todd began to speak, and Dusander raised his hand adamantly, suddenly the world's oldest traffic cop. No, don't contradict me. It's true. Go on if you like. Leave the house. Get out of here. Never come back. Can I stop you? No, of course I can't. Enjoy yourself in Hawaii while I sit in this hot, grease-smelling kitchen and wait to see if the Schwarzen and Watts will decide to start killing policemen and burning their shitty tenements again this year. I can't stop you any more than I can stop getting older a day at a time. They looked at Todd fixedly, so fixedly that Todd looked away. Down deep inside, I don't like you. Nothing could make me like you. You forced yourself on me. You are an unbidden guest in my house. You have made me open crypts perhaps better left shut. Because I have discovered that some of the corpses were buried alive, and that a few of those still have some wind left in them. You yourself has become enmeshed, but do I pity you because of that got im himmel? You have made your bed... Should I pity you if you sleep badly in it? No, I don't pity you and I don't like you, but I have come to respect you a little bit. So don't try my patience by asking me to explain this twice. We could obtain our documents and destroy them here in my kitchen, and still it would not be over. We would, in fact, be no better off than we are at this minute. I don't understand you. No, because you have never studied the consequences of what you have set in motion. But attend me, boy. If we burned our letters here in this jar cover, how would I know you hadn't made a copy? Or two? Or three? Down at the library, they have a Xerox machine. For a nickel, anyone can make a photocopy. For a dollar, you could post a copy of my death warrant on every street corner for twenty blocks. Two miles of death warrants, boy. Think of it. Can you tell me how I would know you hadn't done such a thing? I... Well, I... I... Todd realized he was floundering and forced himself to shut his mouth. All of a sudden, his skin felt too warm, and for no reason at all he found himself remembering something that had happened when he was seven or eight. He and a friend of his had been crawling through a culvert, which ran beneath the old freight bypass road just out of town. The friend, skinnier than Todd, had had no problem... But Todd had gotten stuck. He had become suddenly aware of the feet of rock and earth over his head, all that dark weight. And when an L.A.-bound semi passed above, shaking the earth and making the corrugated pipe vibrate with a low, tuneless and somehow sinister note, he had begun to cry and struggle witlessly, throwing himself forward, pistoning with his legs, yelling for help. At last he had gotten moving again, and when he finally struggled out of the pipe, he had fainted. Dusander had just outlined a piece of duplicity so fundamental that it had never even crossed his mind. He could feel his skin getting hotter, and he thought, I won't cry. And how would you know I hadn't made two copies for my safety deposit box? That I had burned one and left the other there? Trapped. I'm trapped, just like in the pipe that time. And who are you going to yell for now? His heart speeded up at his chest. He felt sweat break on the backs of his hands and the nape of his neck. He remembered how it had been in that pipe. The smell of old water, the feel of the cool ribbed metal, the way everything shook when the truck passed overhead. He remembered how hot and desperate the tears had been. Even if there were some impartial third party we could go to... Always there would be doubts. The problem is insoluble, boy, believe it. Trapped, trapped in the pipe. No way out of this one. He felt the world go gray, won't cry, won't faint. He forced himself to come back. Dusander took a deep drink from his cup and looked at Todd over the rim. Now I tell you two more things. First that if your part in this matter came out, your punishment would be quite small. It is even possible, no more than that likely, that it would never come out in the papers at all. 
I frightened you with reform school once when I was badly afraid you might crack and tell everything, but do I believe that? No. I used it the way a father will use the booger man to frighten a child into coming home before dark. I don't believe that they would send you there. Not in this country where they spank killers on the wrist and send them out onto the streets to kill again after two years of watching color TV in a penitentiary. But it might well ruin your life all the same. There are records and people talk always. They talk. Such a juicy scandal is not allowed to wither. It is bottled like wine. And, of course, as the years pass, your culpability will grow with you. Your silence will grow more damning. If the truth came out today, people would say, but he is just a child, not knowing as I do what an old child you are. But what would they say, boy, if the truth about me, coupled with the fact that you knew about me as early as 1974, but kept silent, came out while you were in high school? That would be bad. For it to come out while you're in college would be disaster. As a young man just starting out in business, Armageddon. You understand this first thing? Tan was silent, but Dusanda seemed satisfied. He nodded. Still nodding, he said, Second, I don't believe you have a letter. Todd strove to keep a poker face, but he was terribly afraid his eyes had widened in shock. Dusander was studying him avidly, and Todd was suddenly, nakedly aware that this old man had interrogated hundreds, perhaps thousands, of people. He was an expert. Todd felt that his skull had turned to window glass, and all things were flashing inside in large letters. I asked myself, whom would you trust so much? Who are your friends? Whom do you run with? Whom does this boy, this self-sufficient, coldly controlled little boy, go to with his loyalty? The answer is nobody. Dusander's eyes gleamed yellowly. Many times I have studied you and calculated the odds. I know you. And I know much of your character. No, not all, because one human being can never know everything that is in another human being's heart. But I know so little about what you do and whom you see outside of this house. So I think, do, Sander, there is a chance that you are wrong. After all these years, do you want to be captured and maybe killed because you misjudged a boy? Maybe when I was younger I would have taken the chance. The odds are good odds, and the chance is a small chance. It is very strange to me, you know. The older one becomes, the less one has to lose in matters of life and death. And yet one becomes more and more conservative. He looked hard into Todd's face. I have one more thing to say, and then you can go when you want. What I have to say is that... While I doubt the existence of your letter, never doubt the existence of mine. The document I have described to you exists. If I die today, tomorrow everything will come out. Everything. Then there's nothing for me, Todd said. He uttered a dazed little laugh. Don't you see that? What there is, years will go by, and as they pass, your hold on me will become worth less and less, because no matter how important my life and liberty remain to me, the Americans, and yes, even the Israelis, will have less and less interest in taking them away. Yeah? Then why don't they let that guy Hess go? If the Americans had sole custody of him, the Americans who let killers out with a spank on the wrist, they would have let him go, Dusander said. Are the Americans going to allow the Israelis to extradite an 80-year-old man so they can hang him as they hanged Eichmann? I think not. Not in a country where they put photographs of firemen rescuing kittens from trees on the front pages of city newspapers. No, your hold over me will weaken, even as mine over you grows stronger. No situation is static, and there will come a time if I live long enough, when I will decide what you know no longer matters, then I will destroy the document. But so many things could happen to you in between. Accidents, sickness, disease. Dusander shrugged. 
There will be water if God wills it, and we will find it if God wills it, and we will drink it if God wills it. What happens is not up to us. Todd looked at the old man for a long time, for a very long time. There were flaws in Dusander's arguments. There had to be. A way out, an escape hatch, either for both of them or for Todd alone. A way to cry it off. Times, guys, I hurt my foot, ollie ollie in free. A black knowledge of the years ahead trembled somewhere behind his eyes. He could feel it there, waiting to be born as conscious thought. Everywhere he went, everything he did. He thought of a cartoon character with an anvil suspended over its head. By the time he graduated from high school, Dusander would be eighty-one, and that would not be the end. By the time he collected his B.A., Dusander would be eighty-five, and he would still feel that he wasn't old enough. He would finish his master's thesis and graduate school the year Dusander turned eighty-seven, and Dusander still might not feel safe. No, Todd said thickly. What you're saying, I can't face that. My boy, Dusander said gently. And Todd heard for the first time, and with dawning horror, the slight accent the old man had put on the first word. My boy, you must. Todd stared at him, his tongue swelling and thickening in his mouth, until it seemed it must fill his throat and choke him. Then he wheeled and blundered out of the house. Dusander watched all of this with no expression at all. And when the door had slammed shut and the boy's running footsteps stopped, meaning that he had mounted his bike, he lit a cigarette. There was, of course, no safe deposit box, no document. But the boy believed those things existed. He had believed utterly. He was safe. It was ended. But it was not ended. That night they both dreamed of murder, and both of them awoke in mingled terror and exhilaration. Todd awoke with the now familiar stickiness of his lower belly. Dusander, too old for such things, put on the SS uniform and then lay down again, waiting for his racing heart to slow. The uniform was cheaply made and already beginning to fray. In Dusander's dream, he had finally reached the camp at the top of the hill. The wide gate slid open for him and then rumbled shut on its steel track once he was inside. Both the gate and the fence surrounding the camp were electrified. His scrawny, naked pursuers threw themselves against the fence in wave after wave. Dusanda had laughed at them, and he had strutted back and forth, his chest thrown out, his cap cocked at exactly the right angle. The high, whiny smell of burning flesh filled the black air, and he had awakened in Southern California, thinking of jack-o'-lanterns and the night when vampires seek the blue flame. Two days before the Bodens were scheduled to fly to Hawaii, Todd went back to the abandoned train yard where folks had once boarded trains for San Francisco, Seattle, and Las Vegas, where other older folks had once boarded the trolley for Los Angeles. It was nearly dusk when he got there. On the curve of the freeway 900 yards away, most of the cars were now showing their parking lights. Although it was warm, Todd was wearing a light jacket. Tucked into his belt under it, was a butcher knife wrapped in an old hand towel. He had purchased the knife in a discount department store, one of the big ones surrounded by acres of parking lot. He looked under the platform where the wino had been the month before. His mind turned and turned, but it turned on nothing. Everything inside him at that moment was shades of black on black. What he found was the same wino, or possibly another. They all looked pretty much the same. Hey! Todd said, Hey, you want some money? The wino turned over, blinking. He saw Todd's wide, sunny grin and began to grin back. A moment later, the butcher knife descended, all wicker snicker and chrome white, slicker slicing through the stubbly right cheek. Blood sprayed. Todd could see the blade in the wino's opening mouth and then its tip caught for a moment in the left corner of the wino's lips, pulling his mouth into an insanely cockeyed grin. Then it was the knife that was making the grin. He was carving the wino like a Halloween pumpkin. He stabbed the wino thirty-seven times. He kept count. 
Thirty-seven, counting the first strike, which went through the wino's cheek and then turned his tentative smile into a great grisly grin. The wino stopped trying to scream after the fourth stroke. He stopped trying to scramble away from Todd after the sixth. Todd then crawled all the way under the platform and finished the job. On his way home, he threw the knife into the river. His pants were bloodstained. He tossed them into the washing machine and set it to wash cold. There were still faint stains on the pants when they came out, but that didn't concern him. They would fade in time. He found the next day that he could barely lift his right arm to the level of his shoulder. He told his father he must have strained it throwing pepper with some of the guys in the park. It'll get better in Hawaii, Dick Bowden said, ruffling Todd's hair. And it did. By the time they came home, it was as good as new.